It's never gonna happen. I can't do it. I can't wake up. We even got a rooster. But then, Grandma offered to babysit. Alright, let's go. I'll show you what it is I want to tackle. Ooh, here's the incredibly beautiful sketch from college. I don't even know what's going on. Well, at least it's numbered. So if there was an opportunity to finally take a few sewing classes, I would say it was about three and a half to four years ago. One of the assignments was to drape a kimono inspired to piece blouse. And I was super pregnant with my son back then. Huge belly and all. And I don't think my memory was exactly there with me because the dress form I ran to grab and claim as my own was definitely much smaller than what I actually am. So everything I've sewn did not fit. I mean, back then definitely did not fit, but nor does it fit right now. So the idea is to recreate one of the projects. It was super easy, I think. Should I demonstrate? Probably not. Here she is. This could be a look. Beautiful. I don't know what's going on in the back. Another reason why I'm excited about this project is because of the fabric I'm going to be using is this beautiful silk shermos that drapes amazingly. But what's so awesome about it is this very old technique called batik, which is silk painting. It comes from Indian Asia and it has been popularized in the Eastern European countries for ages now. My aunt has been painting and silk using this technique and it would be wonderful to continue her path and develop the skill as well. She passed away so it's a, a bit of a sentimental thing to me I would say and I've never tried it before so I'm super excited and I would love to take you along on the journey with me. And for all of our sanity I think we need a new sketch. Well, I'm not sure if it's necessary because this project is supposed to be pretty simple and there's already a not so flattering sample of a blouse created earlier, but I'm kind of in a mood for sketching, so here we are. For the sake of it, maybe I can at least indicate how the flowers will flow that I want to paint in the fabric, but we will get into more detail regarding this a little later. First things first, we need a decent sized sheet of fabric for the front of the back which will give us ample room to play and create the first mock-up. I've selected a regular muslin that will hopefully mimic the actual fashion fabric and give an idea of how the end result might look. Now that there is a perfect square or a rectangle in my case, we need to establish the crosswise grain. Always press on a straighter grain, especially if you're working on a true bias cut piece, otherwise it might stretch and distort the fabric like there's no tomorrow. With the visible crease suggesting the true bias line of the fabric, it is good practice to hand stitch along the bias line in order to have stable visible reference to use as guide for draping the fabric beautifully and with balance on the dress form. Oh, this is gonna be forever. Hold on a second. Oh, there you go. Oh. And now let the fun begin. If you actually know what you're doing, which clearly I do not. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Based on the amazing detailed notes I've taken three years ago, 
And if my memory serves me right, the bias line is placed directly along the center front of the form. Here's what I also remember. This might not be necessary at this stage because I'm only working on the mock-up, but if you have already moved on to the fashion fabric, let it hang for at least 24 hours beforehand. Bias cut clothing will stretch, it's inevitable, but you can help the fabric stretch earlier on so that there is less stretching happening in the future. Use pins to shape the design by gliding the fabric away from the center and pinning it in place. Use pins to hold the shapes. Use pins for pretty much everything while you're draping. Now that the front and back are established, it's time to cut. But hell, you may ask. <laughs> I have no idea. I just went with it, thankfully because there's a lot of fabric to work with. There is also a lot of room for mistakes and figuring things out. So the second part was sleeves, which I eyeballed, wanting them to be flared and wide based on the sketch. I've tried draping and cutting them like so as well. And then the hem was eyeballed and shaped on the go. I wasn't I wasn't trying to think too much and just went with it. So here we are, the blouse has been cut in half in order to transfer onto a sheet of pattern paper. I'm not sure exactly why, but the area where the undersleeve will meet the waist needs to be rounded off. It's it's so my notes, so I'm just following instructions. Perhaps this is for a smooth transition since the sleeve and the bodice is all one large fabric. There's also obviously not enough fabric on the back sleeve, so that will have to be taken into account once the fabric is transferred onto paper. I want to mark all of the important areas in both the front and the back piece of this mock-up, which will help in creating the pattern. So I'm marking creases, folds, and whatnot. Now let's cut off all the seam lines. And now we can start marking on the paper. I'm aligning areas and marking notches on the front and the back so that important parts such as sleeves, collar, and pretty much everything aligns when the final mock-up is sewn. Technically speaking, this is not even supposed to be such a difficult thing to sew. A mock-up is not even necessary. My instructor once said that he created a draped two-piece gown in a matter of hours for a friend who had an event to go to, so I'm just being difficult because I need a well-designed prototype to help guide me on sketching where the flowers will go and how everything will flow. Now that we have the front and the back pattern pieces ready, let's repeat the whole process all over again, <laughs> if you have the patience. But this time I'll actually sew the entire and hopefully final mock-up together. When tracing pattern of bias, it's a good idea not to fold the fabric in half right at the center front or center back, but rather trace one side, flip the paper pattern, and then trace the other side. Fabric shifts, it really, really does, and you want both of the sides to be identical. Alright, the mock-up has been stitched to the lines. I call it the potato sack. Moving on. Initially, the blouse was supposed to be as plain as possible. No pleats, darts. Now I'm realizing it's not going to happen. Either all of the extra fabric needs to be somehow eliminated, or we fold the stuff and create pleats. Here are some of the changes made. The front collar will now overlap the back collar. It was just weird before. A pleat has been created in front where collar meets shoulder. Now all the bulk is gone. It actually might be kind of cool to paint the flowers in the front and behind the pleats so that they are visible only from certain angles. I don't know. It could be something to think about. 
also love a little bit of skin peekaboo. Definitely not having a seam there. I'll probably finish the raw edge with a bias tape. All of these weird design choices have been made in a matter of minutes as I was trying to figure out what the heck to do with the horrible bulkiness that turned out to be the blouse. Now because the pattern will stay as is, all that needs to be done is for me to mark where the pleats will eventually go. I'm not even going to fuss about making all the necessary adjustments now because I don't know how the blouse will act when it's created out of actual fashion fabric. I can easily make changes to the location of the pleats, the underarm cutouts, length of sleeves, and even the hem of the blouse when it's all ready to be sewn. I've sketched variations of Northern California coastal flowers and we'll transfer them onto the blouse. Easier said than done, right? <laughs> the front has been completed, just need to outline with the pen for better visibility. But with the back, I want to play around a little more because it's going to be a tiny bit more complicated. I want it to be extremely busy there and clean in the front. So right around here, things didn't really go to plan. Initially I wanted the blouse to be finished by now so that I could take these lovely shots on location where these specific species of plants grow, but that did not happen. However, the trip to the particular location did, without the blouse. The trip turned out to be kind of a blessing really, because look what I spotted. These are riverbank lupine flowers that I've already made sketches of and they're so tiny, it's so cool to see how they grow in clusters and to study all the details. But I found more. And we'll try to incorporate some of these flower variations back at home. And now that we're back home, let's start sketching again. Initially the idea was to create more of the bouquet arrangement of the field flowers, but now that I'm moving everything around in Photoshop, it seems cool to me to place them closer to how they would appear in wild, where individual types grow in clusters rather than mixed. Outlining the flowers with a pen onto the fabric like Swedish transfer paper, it's more for the precision and accurate indication of all the outlines since I'll use this as a guide for painting on the actual silk fabric. And this is how the plants will flow. Still not enough spiglets perhaps. Maybe we need to add more flowers as well. I can sort of picture the end result in the head and it's asking for a little bit more. Time to prepare the fabric for painting. Sure moves needs to be washed with shampoo and rinsed with hair conditioner, believe it or not. Air dry, pressed, and allowed to stretch for at least 24 hours. And then it hit me. Do I really need to allow it to stretch for 24 hours since it'll be stretched on a frame? regardless. But first, you need to build a stable wooden frame or find someone awesome enough to build it for you. Then we need to stretch the fashion fabric very tightly onto the wooden frame. Work on one side first, then the opposite, stretching the fabric and pinning the corners. Then the center, followed by loads of pins in between. Another important note is to make sure that the length and cross grain of the fabric run straight in both directions, parallel to the frame. We will work on one side of the blouse pattern piece at a time. Starting with the back, the pattern needs to be thread marked onto the silk fashion fabric. This edge over here, which is part of the neckline facing that folds inside the blouse, it runs parallel to the salvage edge of the fabric. And if I lay the pattern as such, the exact crosswise grain is established, meaning the piece will hang properly when draped on the form. Now we need to transfer all of this onto the actual silk fabric. I know that the pencil markings, or any sort of markings on silk other than thread is taboo, but I have no choice, I need flower guidelines, and the silk is not transparent enough for the template to come through when placed underneath. So because this is pretty much turning out to be an art piece regardless, I'll trace as lightly as possible and will eventually hide the lines with resist, hopefully. Resist is the substance that if prepared and then applied to fabric correctly can help prevent dyes from seeping through. So. You pretty much draw a barrier to contain the different dye colors within particular shapes. There are many various techniques to this art form and um, resins can be found online ready to use or you can make it yourself. 
I found a recipe on YouTube provided by a very skillful and talented artist named Alona Story, and I've preferred this approach because this is something my aunt has been doing. This technique is called potic, and the resist consists of carefully boiled paraffin, rubber cement and white gasoline into one mixture. The substances are melted in a jar in a slowly boiled pan of water, preferably outside. You don't want your home to accidentally explode. Alright, so here's the color palette I put together to go off of based on the images. We're going to make one of each. Let's mix the colors to make a lovely purple using the plain old oil paint. Then in a separate jar you want to mix a small amount of resist and a little bit of oil paint to add color of your preference to gutta. Once again, thank you Alona Story for these wonderful instructions. This over here is a very delicate glass applicator for gutta resist. I purchased two tubes from Etsy a few years ago, which I believe were shipped from Ukraine or maybe Russia. For the life of me, I cannot find these applicators sold in the States. They are rarely used by the artists these days, especially here in North America. However, these little tools have been used by my aunt some 30 years ago, and so here we are. Learning curve is an understatement when it comes to this technique. There are so many factors that go into applying the line when painted onto the fabric, from the weight of the fabric to the consistency of resist so that it penetrates through the material to the thickness of lines making sure that there are no breaks within shapes and training your hand to run steadily and smoothly across the canvas because we also want the lines to be clean and pretty. Oh, but it's so much fun! <laughs> Normally you want the resist to fill up half of the circular portion of the applicator. This allows resist to run easily and quite fast out of the opening. But because this is my first time, I wanted control. Also all of what you're seeing right now is definitely sped up. It took me a very long time. Alright, let's prepare fabric dyes. These are cellulose, jacquard, prosio, namex fabric dyes. They also work well with fiber fabric such as silk so long as the work is fixed correctly afterwards. They are great because all we need is water and they can be mixed to create tone and color variations. Very similar to watercolors or so I've been told. And here's the moment of truth. Let's just have fun and start painting. Please don't believe the speed of my painting abilities. This is all the magic of Premiere Pro. The process is in fact quite slow and meticulous. Well, in my case it is. This entire project is pretty much an experiment, really. Just trying to figure out how to work the dyes, control the flow of the water, how to mix colors, create gradation, depth, and add volume to the plants. Hair dryer can help speed up the drying process since about 20 to 25 percent of color saturation disappears after the dye dries. So it's a matter of building the color intensity up and using darker tones, including black. I did not want the flowers to appear flat, and by the time I transitioned to the front piece of the blouse, my skills or lack thereof kind of improved. You'll probably see what I'm talking about later in the video.
Once in a while the dye did shoot out of the designated area because the resist wasn't applied properly to contain it. And although I was able to fix those areas by painting plants on top, this still isn't supposed to happen because you do want control over what you're doing. Thankfully I got the hang of applying resist by the time I worked on the front piece. Time to steam the fabric in order to fix the dyes. Using lightweight art paper that is larger than the fabric piece itself, we need to place the dyed fabric on top. Carefully roll all the layers into a tube, making sure that the fabric does not crease, and then we fold it into a cinnamon bun and tie it securely with a string. The ceramic mugs are placed into a very large pot, filled halfway with water and covered with a plate. Take a little break and wait for the water to boil. Then place the coil into a pot onto the plate, cover with aluminum foil and lid. I gave the fabric hour and a half to steam thoroughly on low simmer setting. Meanwhile, prepare an afterbath with warm water and a bit of distilled vinegar. This will further help solidify the dyes and soften the silk fabric. Then we press the fabric and inspect. Goodness, <laughs> the thickness of resist has completely dissolved. There's nothing left but color, it's just weightless dye that saturates the fabric beautifully. Yay, we can move on to the front of the blouse! Alright, now we need to create the underlayer. This is the fabric that is attached behind the fashion fabric to help create structure if this is what your heart desires. The two layers are then treated as one. My shirmose has a lot of drape and I really like the look of that fabric, but I want the structure of the mock-up blouse that was created earlier out of muslin. So we will thread trace the pattern with the basting stitched onto a higher quality cotton fabric, then place the underlayer on top of silk, back sides together, and hand sew the two together on flat surface along all of the seam lines without lifting the fabric. This will help prevent any shifting. Then carefully cut along the seam lines, maybe add in a bit more extra fabric for any unforeseen adjustments that might happen, especially with fabric that is cut on bias and loves to stretch and distort, <laughs> it really has a mind of its own. Then we fold and press the neckline, just like the sample piece, only with more care, using a silk organza pressing cloth to help prevent any accidental staining. I need to find thread that is strong enough to hold 8 layers of fabric together, which is probably silk. And now we want to attach the collar to the front of the blouse with an invisible hand stitch. This will prevent the collar or neckline from shifting while the two pattern pieces are handled and constructed together. Constant neckline readjustments will otherwise drive me crazy. On to stitching the two sides of the blouse together. First, we need to attach the neckline. Overlapping the back with the front, we secure with an invisible hand stitch. Then, we need to find and thread mark where the pleats are. Press, and let the fabric cool to help hold the pleats better. And maybe add a few hidden hand stitches for extra security. Then baste the shoulder seams together for a quick fitting. 
I'm not happy with the neckline. It holds nicely when it's in a dress form, but look what happens when I wear it. What the heck is this? The neckline is not holding its shape. And I knew it. I knew there needed to be some sort of undue structure, but I ignored that little inkling. So, we either have goat hair canvas or silk and canza. Goat hair canvas is more structured, so goat hair canvas it is. Pad stitching can help hold a particular shape and add structure to the garment, but I've only done so on a wool coat. Not sure if it'll work on silk. So we shall see. This blouse is slowly turning into a coat. Well, winter is right around the corner. Might as well. I wish my fingers could work this fast. It would have been cool. The extra canvas which lays beyond the seam lines is then cut off. Neckline is secured from possible stretching with twill tape and fingers crossed. I will see you soon where we left off before this whole fiasco occurred. Well, here's the moment of truth. So the reason why the canvas underlining worked is because of the sheer amount of silk and cotton layers in this neckline. Eight to be exact. Had it been two or four layers, I would have used organza's understructure. Moving on. I tell you, these shoulder seams are something. I was really debating what to do with them. At first the idea was to create a French seam, but there are too many layers and it would be hard to make the fabric lay flat. Then I decided to go with a flat welt seam and thought that this could be sewn with extremely tiny and pretty much invisible stitches instead of the machine stitch which normally sits on top and is quite visible. And then right around here it hit me that I'm doing something wrong. But then this happened. And I don't know how to explain it, but it's super exciting how this unnameable, well, by me at least, seam has turned out. This cool flat piping kind of effect has been serendipitously created and the shoulder seams are now in fact quite secure considering there are three separate stitches holding the two sides together. Alright, before we stitch everything together, the silk has more drape than the muslin underlining and typically you would want both of the fabrics that are treated as one to have similar drape. I kind of knew it all along, but who wants to follow the rules, right? So, over time this droopiness developed because, as mentioned, bias will always stretch throughout its entire lifetime. And I don't think I've allowed the fabric to hang and stretch long enough before I began working on it. It's also pretty much a matter of storing it properly. Obviously, no hangers and I guess not wearing it too often might also be helpful. With that said, it's a good idea to drape this piece in a dress form and adjust the fabric so that all the layers lay nicely when the final stitching is done. It's just a matter of fiddling around and readjusting the fabric. Obviously the blouse doesn't look perfect just yet, mostly because it's held up by pins and among many other things it still needs a good pressing. And just to be sure that the piece will in fact fit correctly I'm gonna try on the mock-up once again. Snap out of it. You're not done yet. And just to be sure that the piece will in fact fit correctly, I'm gonna try on the mock-up once again for some peace of mind before proceeding into the very intricate hand stitching. Please pay attention only to the right side that left has been completely disassembled. We want to address the correct length of the hemline before working on covering the sides of the blouse with the bias tape. I've stitched marked along the hemline and pinked the edge. There will only be a few points where the blouse is attached, so all four sides need to be finished with the bias tape, which are strips cut on bias from the same silk fabric. So to create the bias tape, we just fold the strips in half, press, then fold the two opposite edges inward, and press along the way with every fold. Let's lay out the tape along the edge and create a thread mark guide as we indicate exactly along which line to sew the bias tape. 
The tape needs to be attached along the front with a small hand stitch and make sure that it aligns with a guideline. The fabric is a little slippery so I just took my time. Personally, using a sewing machine would probably take even longer. I feel like there's so much more control with hand stitching and it's so meditative. I love it! Then we cut off the excess fabric which lays beyond the width of the bias tape. I think my tape is about 3 eighths of an inch. And as always, team your work, it makes a world of a difference. We then flip the fabric and secure the other edge of the bias tape to the back side with an invisible hand stitch. Look at that stitch that ran off from the rest. And now I'm kind of tempted to resell this part. Just kidding. I'm not that nuts. Well, yes I am. And we're done! Kind of. Okay, this is for a different project in mind. I have a few hemline samples that were created a while back. Where are they? Here we go. This definitely is not it and neither is this. I think this hem is meant for a skirt or a dress. This is it. I think it's called a soft rolled hemline. Perfect. Basically, we need a white strip of flannel, a piece that is wider than the folded fabric, Cut on bias and attached at various areas with the catch stitch. This technique will create a soft edge along the hemline or anywhere else you would like to apply the finish. I think it'll work perfect in our case because the blouse already has these soft and somewhat bulky edges all around. And I know that ideally you would want the least amount of bulk as possible, but the thickness of fabric works in this garment. I think it creates these cool lines and forms. Somehow it just feels right to me. Alright, where are we? So the flannel is folded onto itself, the edge is aligned with the inner edge of the hem of the blouse, and then the two are attached to the catch stitch. I am sewing through both the underlining and the silk, while catching only a few threads so that the stitch is pretty much invisible on the front side. Then we press per usual. <laughs> It's a little difficult to describe what it is I'm doing. <laughs> Even I'm confused, I think. We fold the remaining fashion fabric on top of, um, oh my gosh, the bias flannel. Make sure that the width is even throughout and press. After a crease is created due to pressing, we use it as a guide to hand sew tiny running stitches through muslin and silk to prevent any shifting and then we attach this edge to the front of the blouse with these tiny and pretty much invisible catch stitches sewing through all the layers of the fabric <laughs> uh. okay so this is it this hem will be repeated on all of the remaining raw edges of the blouse which is the hem on the other side of the blouse and the two sleeves Oh my goodness gracious, we are on to the very last step. I feel like sitting, if only I could. Okay, we want to fold the bottom edge at the sides where the pleats are marked and stitch that part with heavy silk thread, button thread to be exact. I've actually went back and secured where the two colors meet using this thread as well. Now we want to attach the two sides together at the bottom edge using an invisible hand stitch and with the buttonhole thread once again. That's the actual correct terminology. I stopped sewing at about 7 eighths of an inch from the bottom. Now we want to connect the underarm of the sleeve with yet another invisible hand stitch, using a regular silk thread this time around. We're nearly there. Actually, <laughs> we're already there. Let's just talk through some of the final adjustments made. I went ahead and restructured the area where sleeves meet the collar by increasing the width of the pleat on front and back to help hold the shape better, and slightly pulled the sleeves up to shorten the length. Oh, and added these decorative green Japanese silk stitches, which also serve as further reinforcement between the pleats and sleeves. I really want the blouse to hold its shape. 